On November 4th, 2008, in a watershed moment, Barack Obama was elected as our president, the first African American to hold the nation's highest office. Who of us can forget that joyful night in Grant Park? For President Obama, the joy and hope of that night quickly gave way to the realities of his role as he was immediately called upon to solve a financial crisis that threatened the economic solvency of the U.S. and engage in high-stakes international diplomacy that earned him the Nobel Peace Prize in 2009. President Obama also followed through on his commitment to provide individuals and families with access to health care by leading the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which has become more appreciated by more Americans since then. Back in 2004, then-Senator-elect Obama addressed this club when he foresaw the formidable challenges ahead and asked whether the political parties would work together to solve them. And in 2017, shortly after he had served our nation as president for two terms, he appeared before our members, commenting on the benefits of global collaboration and the need for the United States to inspire and maintain world order rather than withdraw. Now, we are fortunate again to host President Obama. In the past four years, he has authored and published A Promised Land, a riveting, deeply personal account of his journey and history in the making. And he's worked closely with his team at the Obama Foundation on the development of the Obama Presidential Center in Jackson Park. He is also using the power of his voice and platform to influence dialogue on many of the crucial issues we face, from the state of our democracy, race, and climate, to the importance of basic civics education for children. On behalf of all of us, I'm honored to welcome President Obama to the Economic Club of Chicago to discuss these issues and many more. Welcome, President Obama. Thank you so much, Deborah, and uh, it's wonderful to be with the Economic Club once again. I wish I could be there in person. Uh, uh, I miss you, and I know that uh, there are a lot of friends who who are part of this uh, part of this wonderful institution. Well, we'll take that as an acceptance for an in-person visit sometime <laughs> soon. Thank you. That's great. Uh, let's start with the Obama Presidential Center. Uh, we mentioned that the groundbreaking is coming, and this is a very dynamic uh, institution. It's not going to be a traditional presidential library. Can you talk about your vision for the center and why you chose uh, your adopted hometown to locate the center? Well, uh, uh, first of all, right before I left office, you know, I, I talked to Michelle and, you know, uh, advisors about uh, you know how I might want to spend my post presidency. I, I was one of the younger ex presidents uh, or soon to be ex presidents, and uh, uh, you know there are a lot of issues that I care about. Some of the some of them you mentioned, Deborah. But uh, what, what I was absolutely convinced of was the most important thing I could do was to help mobilize and motivate and convene and inspire the next generation of leadership. Uh, because uh, you know, m many of the problems that we face in this country, uh, whether it's political polarization or specific issues like uh, you know, you know, the racial divide and, and criminal justice system or climate change or economic inequality, we've actually got some good answers. Uh, the, the problem is not a lack of policy. The problem is the difficulty in, in bringing people together to actually work constructively and get things done. And that requires leadership at every level, not just at the federal level, but at the state, city, neighborhood levels. There are a lot of different kinds of leaders, not just political leaders, but business leaders and journalists and uh, opinion makers and nonprofit leaders. And, and so, uh, so our programming at the foundation is designed to help 
uh, cultivate and promote and support leadership, not just in Chicago, not just across the country, but around the world. But we needed a place to do that. And the, you know, traditionally presidential libraries, I think, can be uh, a little backward looking in the sense of they're, they're a celebration of a presidency or a president sometimes maybe um, kind of a, a mausoleum uh, in the sense of not much is happening. Uh, our thought was, well, let's create a, a, an institution that is alive and vibrant and is bringing people together and providing workshops and convenings and uh, performance and, you know, is, is a cultural as w and teaching institution as well as uh, a museum and you know we've begun that we began that design and we started looking and there was no other place than for us to have it on the south side of chicago um you know jackson park when i first came to chicago as a community organizer from new york i drove down the skyway through jackson park that was the first part of chicago i ever saw i i my, the first apartment I had was uh, in Hyde Park. Uh, yeah. Michelle grew up I know. Uh, just south of Jackson Park and South Shore. Our daughters were born there. That was uh, the first uh, state legislative district that I represented. Uh, so I began my political career there. It has given us so much. And our goal here was to give back. The instinct was that if we were going to build a substantial cultural and learning institution and museum, uh, that's a big project. It's a big economic engine. It's an anchor uh, for activity. And, and uh, it's estimated that it's going to attract uh, around 750,000, uh, maybe more visitors a year. Um, that having it on the south side uh, was a way of um, stitching together the lakefront and 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 making sure that the south side was you know uh, on on par with the wonderful cultural institutions that we have downtown and uh, heading north and uh, and and so uh, throughout this process our goal has been how do we create an institution that not only is helping to promote the sort of uh, civic engagement and uh, you know, progressive change that uh, I believe happens when ordinary people just get involved in their communities. Um, but also, how can we make this into something that uh, helps bring Chicago together at a time yes. when Chicago, like much of the country, sometimes feels divided? Yes. Well, thank you. We are glad you picked Chicago, and it is the the perfect and perfect. only location for your center and we look forward to uh, being a part of it. So let's talk a little bit about Chicago. I mentioned that great night in Grant Park in 2008. Chicago is very different and I would venture to say many of our urban areas are quite different now than they were in 2008. How do you see Chicago and the, the, the big cities in the U.S. in terms of, are they better? Are they worse? What do you see as the challenges? What do you hear or say when people around the world ask you about Chicago now? Well, look, I, I think Chicago, I, one of the things I've always loved about the city is, uh, I think it is representative of so much of America, right? And, and that's true of Illinois. Chicago's yes. at the crossroads of north, south, east, west. Uh, amazing diversity. It's, it's a city of immigrants. It's got one of the most uh, vibrant uh, African-American communities in the country, yes. but also one of the most vibrant Latino communities and Polish and uh, Indian American and Irish. And, you know, so in that sense, not only is it, is it demographically representative, but uh, Chicago, unlike some major industrial cities uh, were, was able to transition uh, during the 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, to become a diversified economy, yes. uh, one that was 
initially reliant yes. primarily on heavy industry and then yes. uh, moved into the knowledge space uh, and the, and the you know, sort of content production and tech uh, and uh, service industries successfully, partly because of great universities, uh, partly because of great um, you know, anchor headquarters of, of, of businesses, uh, partly because of great cultural institutions. So in, in many ways, Chicago's never looked better. And I think that visitors, when I travel around Chicago, other than winter, uh, other than the weather, people love Chicago. But what I think has also happened in Chicago, um, and in this sense, maybe it's, it's um, experienced even more acutely what other cities have experienced, is an increasing economic divide that you know, can be traced back to racial segregation, but now often overlaps with economic segregation. Uh, and some of these phenomena are not unique to uh, urban areas, but in urban areas, you see it most acutely, knowledge workers, you know, uh, businesses that are succeeding, succeed really well. Uh, folks who are relying on blue collar work, uh, uh, and don't have as much leverage, uh, they and the communities where they live fall further behind. The, the ladders of opportunity, uh, you know, the rungs on them uh, have become wider. Uh, again, this is a global phenomenon, but you see it in Chicago. Uh, and, uh, and as a consequence, I think that uh, so often the image of Chicago is being dictated by some of the bad news rather than all the great news. In particular, issues of crime, issues of uh, police community relations, uh, that sense of a racial slash economic divide uh, so that there are almost two cities. And it's one of the reasons why I think that uh, the Obama Presidential Center can be a, a powerful engine. It gives us an opportunity to uh, locate in a community and have a presence that signifies this is an important part of our city. And if we get this right, and if we open these doors to opportunity for the residents of the South Side and you know, by extension, uh, other parts of the city uh, that sometimes feel left behind, um, if young people there start imagining, envisioning that they're a part of this broader community and they count, um, that I think can help overcome, be one component in overcoming what I would argue is the one thing that's holding Chicago back. Yes. It is a world-class city and is viewed as such, but yes. I think that is the, uh, the, the millstone when it comes to how businesses, how visitors, others think about Chicago. It's that, that concern that once you get outside the Loop or the North Side or Wrigleyville uh, or Lincoln Park, then now you're in uncharted territory and and obviously those of us who live on the south side and you know know what uh the, the incredible businesses and institutions and, and communities that are there uh know sometimes are are false stereotypes but you know unfortunately you know there are communities that have experienced extraordinary trouble uh and difficulty yes. for decades since I first arrived back in 1985. And, and uh, we, we all have to make an effort to bridge those gaps if we want Chicago to be everything it can be. Yes, just briefly, um, were you surprised at how business leaders really stepped up this year in being open, active, and vocal about key issues? And what role do you think our business community here in Chicago has to play in addressing some of these challenges in Chicago? You know, I, I, I was encouraged. Um, you know, when you look at last summer uh, in the wake of uh, uh, the murder of George Floyd uh, and, and the activism that it inspired, uh, particularly among young people of all races, 
uh, who said this is not the America we uh, uh, you know, we expect and we want to do better. Uh, I was encouraged that uh, the business community recognized they had a role to play. Uh, and there wasn't just a knee-jerk reaction of, let's tamp that down, but in, instead there was some, uh, some reflection and, and uh, you know, uh, people asking tough questions about how can we be responsive. Um, and, and, and in that sense, I'm encouraged. I think that the key for businesses now is to, to think, how, how do we move beyond either uh, philanthropy alone Philanthropy is important, supporting uh, organizations that are giving kids more opportunities, that are you know, helping uh, rebuild neighborhoods. Uh, all that stuff's important. So, so in no way do I want to diminish the importance of, of uh, the checkbook and, and uh, philanthropic efforts by companies. Um, I think uh, some of the symbolic gestures that have been made uh, are serious and, and significant. Um, you know, when, when companies make a decision that, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're troubled by uh, restrictive voting legislation, uh, you know, companies have the ability to get the attention of elected officials in ways that sometimes uh, breaks through the usual partis partisan lines. Um, but I think that the, the the place where some companies have done better, all companies have to uh, do more, is thinking about, all right, how do we use our uh, resources, yes. our business practices, yes. to help remake our economy? Yes. So, for example, uh, companies that are taking seriously diversifying their supply chain, and saying, you know, how, how many African American or Latino businesses are we contracting with, and can we do better? And if there's nobody in that particular space, uh, is there a way for us to partner with a smaller business that maybe can't take on all of the work that we need for our various functions, but uh, can take on a small part, and then we can help train up so that over time they build capacity. What are we doing when it comes to our own in internal hiring practices? Yes. Are we doing enough yes. to diversify our workforce? And if it turns out that uh, we are having trouble finding highly qualified black or brown candidates, what are we doing to expand the pool by yes. you know, creating training programs and apprenticeship programs and you know, insisting you know, that, that we push harder uh, on those issues. Uh, I think that's the next phase, and, and we've seen some businesses do that more effectively than others. What they usually discover, by the way, is that by doing so, they don't just ingratiate themselves or uh, get a checkbox on being politically correct. It actually makes their businesses function better. Absolutely. Uh, and they're finding talent that they wouldn't have otherwise found. Um, and, you know, uh, by the way, when it comes to that, it, those internal practices, that uh, has to be not just at the uh, entry level, but also at the yes. at the highest levels of, of yes. a company. I mean, what does your boards look like? What do your yes. executives look like? And, yes. and obviously, Deborah, you won't mind me saying this applies to how we think about women, not just minority uh, candidates uh, yes. for these uh, for these jobs. As president, sometimes people ask me what was some of the most important lessons I learned, what were some of the most yes. important lessons I learned as president? In making decisions, one of the things that was most valuable to me, whether it was in the situation room or the cabinet room, whether it was on domestic policy or foreign policy, was having a range of perspectives yes. so that we were looking at a problem, not in a group think way, but from a bunch of different directions. And that allowed us to catch mistakes, anticipate problems, execute more effectively, communicate more effectively. Uh, and I think what is true, uh, what was true for, for me is, is true for uh, corporate decision making as well. Well, I can share with you that I've never seen a commitment in my lifetime 
toward uh, these important matters in the business community than I've seen in the last year. And it is a lot of energy, and it seems to be translating into actual practices, President Obama. Which is great. So you mentioned the Voting Rights Act, and I really want to talk to you about democracy and the state of democracy in the U.S. and you know anywhere else we'd like to talk about it because many of the trends that we see here are not unique. So it's under stress. It's manifesting itself in myriad ways. Can you talk about the causes? Because when I look back at your remarks in 04 and then again in 17, uh, it seems to be worse, not better. And do you share that perspective, the causes, p potentially some of the encouraging signs that you see? This is so critically important right now. No, I, I, look, I, I think um, those of us who grew up um, and watched uh, you know, America and the West prevailed during the Cold War, uh, saw the end of apartheid, Nelson Mandela walking out of that prison, uh, saw the democratization of countries that had previously been under authoritarian uh, or totalitarian rule. Um, you know, that, that optimism uh, that the world was moving in a better direction, I think, uh, have been sobered over the last several years by uh, a uh, a different set of trends. And I think we can, we can trace some of these trends back to uh, the sh changes in the economy that took place during the 70s, 80s, 90s, and then accelerated, um, and in some ways culminated with the financial crisis in 2008 that I inherited when I came into office. Uh, and that, and it's a combination of technology and globalization uh, that created what has often been referred to as a winner-take-all economy. Um, it, it meant that uh, those who were already either uh, specially skilled, had particular technologies, uh, had some advantage in the marketplace, uh, could mobilize globally and gain markets, gain access to markets, uh, farm out, uh, you know, and, and, and take advantage of, of low wages, create incredible efficiencies, all of which created enormous wealth, but it also meant that not only did a bunch of the world, like China, China, uh, not only did it allow them to catch up to America uh, on the global stage, but uh, it also meant that a lot of communities started feeling like they were left behind. And you know, uh, economists have consistently noted that what matters in, in how people feel about their economic well-being typically depends on what does the trend line look like as opposed to their absolute well-being. Uh, and I think in a lot of uh, advanced economies, people started feeling rightly that they were stuck, that you know, uh, their standard of living wasn't improving, uh, and that the stratification in their societies were becoming more acute. Um, and that creates a uh, stress, anger, resentment that I think oftentimes finds expression in populism, both left and right. Uh, what we've seen, I think, in recent years is the energy has been in right-wing populism. Yes. Uh, and that typically expresses itself as, let's find somebody to blame for our plight. Um, and anti-immigrant sentiment uh, that we've seen in Europe uh, you know, concern that minorities are taking advantage and they're the reasons why, you know, we're not doing better, um, uh, a mistrust of elites, all those things combined, I think, into a pretty toxic brew. Um, and you're right, this is not unique to the United States. Uh, we see it in Europe, 
you know, we've seen uh, some of these same trends in parts of the world, let's say like a Turkey or a Hungary that we thought were on the brink of moving into full-fledged democracies and have gone pretty violently in the opposite direction, uh, places like the Philippines uh, and, and, and parts of Latin America. And so uh, in terms of how to respond to it, uh, if you, if you want to sort of label, let's say, the center left and the center right uh, as having been the predominant political forces right after the Cold War, um, I think, and, and I was part of the center left, uh, so you know, I'm uh, uh, including myself in this. I think we have to acknowledge that uh, we did not effectively enough address very real concerns about economic inequality fast enough. In some cases, it was circumstances, right? I, I worked to do this, uh, as did, I think, some others, uh, uh, other leaders in, uh, around the world in terms of uh, having more equitable tax policy, starting to change uh, trade policy, uh, public investment, and so forth. Uh, but we have to go, I think, more uh, quickly to give people some sense that if they work hard, they are able to uh, succeed and their kids are going to be doing at least as well, if not better, uh, than they did. And, and, uh, and so there are, I think, legitimate questions to ask about, you know, uh, I'm somebody who believes that trade can be good for all parties, mm -hmm. but it can't just be uh, completely open markets if, for example, your trading partners aren't reciprocating. And you do have to pay attention to what, what's happening to your workers in your country. Um, I think when it comes to tax policy, you know, I uh, and most of the people who are on this call, uh, we've done well in this economy. But the degree to which there's still resistance to saying we've got to give something back uh, in order to reinvest in those uh, who uh, are still struggling in this economy, I think that's important. And, and I guess the last point I would make on this is that uh, one of the threats to democracy is when people don't feel as if uh, the language of politics is so, one that speaks to their sense of identity and culture and who they are. What's the story we tell about uh, America, for example? Um, I'm a believer that part of the reason I was successful politically was I told a story that was inclusive, but affirmed, you know, America has never been perfect, but it's gotten better. And we're part of that project of making it better. Uh, and and I paid attention to the 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 narrative of uh, America and respect for traditions, even as we have to change other aspects of American history that aren't worth preserving, like racism uh, or or uh, sexism. Um, but I I, I think uh, at times. Uh, you know, the technocratic policymakers uh, neglected to recognize that, you know, it's, it's not just about policy, it's also about how you feel. And uh, I think, you know, uh, the hard right has tapped into, you know, this sense of identity that's based on nativism or anger or resentment or, uh, you know, uh, uh, racial status. Uh, and, and combating that is uh, just as important as, as uh, delivering on economic policy. The good news is I think the Biden administration is right on track in doing uh, you know, what it needs to do to uh, push back against some of uh, these trends, both domestically and internationally. Um, the, and the other piece of good news is that young people actually are on the right side of this. Um, my daughter's generation, they uh, are instinctively inclusive, 
appreciate diversity, believe in democracy, uh, you know, are tolerant, listen. Um, the, but, you know, the question now is, do we hang on long enough to, for them to inherit uh, the country so that uh, they can keep it on the right track? Um, and some of the behavior that we're seeing right now, I'm trying not to be too partisan here, but frankly, uh, in the aftermath of January 6th, uh, the degree to which we were uh, witness to an insurrection, and you had one of the major American political parties um, not only fail to condemn some of that behavior, but embrace uh, a patently false uh, narrative about the election being stolen that is being still perpetuated. Um, and now that same major political party being willing to initiate uh, legislative uh, you know, actions across the country you know, where they're saying, uh, you know, we're going to let partisan state legislatures decide uh, whether or not to certify an election uh, and in institute voter suppression measures that are directly targeted, for example, at cities in those states um, so that there is a different set of rules for uh, how votes are counted in Atlanta versus how they're counted in the rest of Georgia. Uh, you know, that's the kind of dangerous behavior that we're going to have to push back on. And, and look, I think the corporate community has a responsibility to, to at least call folks out on that. Um, not, be, not because that transcends policy. You know, that's different than just should tax rates be higher or lower? You know, what should we do about, you know, some tech regulation or environmental regulation? This really has to do with the, the basic rules by which we all have agreed to to keep this uh, diverse, you know, multiracial uh, democracy functioning. Uh, are we going to stick to those rules or are we going to start uh, rigging the game in a way that breaks it? Uh, and, and that's not going to be good for business, uh, not to mention uh, not good for our, uh, our soul. Exactly. And, and this goes well beyond, as you've said, economic disparities and the stories that we have told ourselves about why we have these divisions in America. And when you think about the filibuster, the government needs to work. And part of the Obama Presidential Center is to teach leaders to solve problems for, for people who need them. So in terms of the filibuster, in terms of uh, these voting rights matters, what do we need to do to make the government work, in your opinion, and protect our, our democracy? Yeah, I, I, I would say that, look, uh, there are some institutional changes that we need just to uh, reinvigorate our democracy and give people confidence that uh, our government can function effectively. Uh, and you've mentioned a couple of them. I, I, before getting to the filibuster, uh, uh, political gerrymandering is something that has increased polarization because if, if parties in power are able to draw the maps to maximize uh, the likelihood that they win a particular seat um, so that only 10% of House congressional districts are competitive. Well, that means that for the vast majority of members of Congress, they never have to try to appeal to the other side. All they're worrying about is the most extreme uh, uh, opponents coming from uh, their left or right flanks. And so that increases polarization. The filibuster, as you mentioned, is something that stymied our ability to respond even more robustly to the financial crisis, uh, you know, and uh, was a source of extraordinary frustration for me. Uh, uh, so far, Joe Biden has not had to wrestle with that directly yet because the American Rescue Plan that he, he 
and his administration were able to put forward that was obviously necessary to respond to the pandemic um, was done through what's called reconciliation. It's sort of a loophole that gets around uh, the filibuster just once. But the fact of the matter is, is that you, you know, it's a limited tool. And so actions on climate change or on immigration or a whole host of other issues, you can't use that tool. Those are bottled up because of the filibuster. That's not something that was in the Constitution. Uh, there was never a discussion by our founders about a supermajority requirement. Uh, it has become a mechanism for the minority to block action on anything uh, and further feeds a sense of cynicism around government. So uh, I am a believer that that has to be significantly modified. And then finally, uh, as you point out, uh, we are alone among major democracies up until recently. You're now starting to see some problems, uh, but not uh, among our major allies like uh, you know, you know, the Canada or the United Kingdom or Japan, uh, in actively discouraging people from voting uh, and doing it systematically. And there's obviously a historical precedent to that that has to do with uh, uh, race and, and, and Jim Crow. Um, but that has continued to this day, and uh, that, that's something that we just can't uh, abide if we believe in the Constitution and the documents that were written. Uh, if you are a citizen of this country, your voice is supposed to be heard, and it is not the task of uh, those of us who have the privilege of being elected and serving to then decide you know what, let's exclude some people from being able to exercise their franchise or make it harder for some than for others to give us a, a, a short-term political advantage. And that's what's being done in a pretty unabashed, unembarrassed way. Uh, and there is legislation pending to potentially address that, but uh, whether it gets through, ironically, will be determined in part by whether or not we can uh, modify the filibuster. When you ask the public about some of the proposed measures to reform and make voting easier, simpler, clearer, and fairer. Uh, you know, the provisions that are in the bill uh, have widespread popularity. Uh, so, you know, we're going to have to break through this, this uh, log jam in order to make the whole system work better. And, and look, the good news, I think, for those of uh, your, your members who are listening who you know, sometimes are skeptical about government regulation or taxation or... It, uh, the, the thing I experienced with respect to business is a lot of times they just want clarity. They, they want clarity in terms of what are the rules, you know, uh, you know what, what, what's the playing field, and then, we, and then we'll play and we'll compete. And the, the... But they also want the government to be able to take clear action when it comes to transportation or cybersecurity or a whole bunch of things on which their businesses depend. Um, we're, we're better off if we've got two parties who are competing fairly based on facts and reason uh, as opposed to opinion and partisanship and, uh, and that's what we can achieve. So do you think that the voting bills are the single most important priority as you look at the threats to democracy? I, I think they are in this country right now. As I said, I think long-term giving people confidence that government action can help folks uh, at, who are having a tougher time in this modern economy uh, fulfill their basic hopes and dreams about supporting a family and making sure their kids are, uh, are doing well. Uh, I think that's obviously just as important. There's one last element of this, Deborah, that I haven't spoken about that I have to uh, touch on, and that has to do with the role of uh, our media and how we get news, because I think this has changed profoundly. Um, you know, when I was growing up, most of the people uh, who are over 50 uh, obviously have the same experience. You had three news stations. And, you know, you could choose Walter Brink uh, or you know, David Brinkley or Walter Cronkite or uh, you know, 
I forget some of the other, John Chancellor, uh, right? But that's where people got their news. You had local news, you had uh, the, the ABC, NBC, CBS affiliates, you had PBS. Everybody operated under some basic journalistic standards about fact checking and the separation of opinion from reporting. Uh, and uh, you had you know, major newspapers like the Tribune or the Sun Times in Chicago. Uh, uh, other, every city had a newspaper, every town had a newspaper that more or less abided by these journalistic standards. And so we all had a certain set of facts that we could agree to. And we might interpret those facts and say, well, I'm taking a conservative position. You know, I think this is what uh, will actually grow the economy, not that. And some people might take a more liberal position on, on this. Uh, but, but at least we were uh, in a common conversation using common language based on a certain common set of assumptions. And that is no longer true. Um, and, and part of what we witnessed on January 6th was the culmination of a media uh, ecosystem that has now been turbocharged by social media in which people just make stuff up. And you can get a third to half of the country believing in stuff that is completely made up. All right? So there was no evidence, <laughs> this was repeatedly shown, that there had been any irregularities, uh, any significant irregularities with respect to the election. And yet, to this day, we now have uh, a majority of Republicans believing there was. There was uh, partly because it was propagated by the person who was occupying the White House. Um, but it, it, it's not just that, right? The, the misinformation around vaccines has in, in, and, and, and how we respond to COVID probably slowed and impeded our ability to deal uh, with the pandemic. Uh, climate change. We can have a debate about what the best way to deal with climate change is, but the fact that we still have large uh, portions of the population that believe climate change is overstated or is a hoax based on what they receive from news stations and Facebook you know, posts and um, you know, talk radio, that's made democracy uh, much more difficult. And so part of the thing I've been trying to think about is, is how do we, um, how do we ad adapt you know, uh, to, to this new media environment in a way that can at least restore some sense that, uh, as, as uh, Senator Moynihan of New York once said, uh, all, we're all entitled to our own opinions, but we're not entitled to our own facts. Um, democracy can't work if we can't agree on uh, you know, uh, the facts in front of us and then have a civil debate about uh, uh, how do we interpret those facts and what should we do uh, in terms of taking uh, uh, some sort of common action. Thank you, President Obama. Before I turn it over to David for some member questions, may I ask you one personal question? Of course. My father lived his life saying he was the luckiest man in the world because he had two daughters. Can you comment on how you feel in the same situation? Uh, you know what? Your dad and I, we're, we're seeing eye to eye. Um, Malia just graduated uh, last week. Uh, it was a virtual graduation. Um, and uh, uh, we had it in our backyard, and I kept my sunglasses on so people wouldn't see me copiously weeping uh, with pride. Uh, you know, my daughters, uh, M Michelle and I, when we discussed the possibility of, of me running for the presidency, and I've written about this, um, one of our biggest concerns was, well, what would this do to our kids? You know, they, Malia was 10 at the time, Sasha was seven when we left Chicago. Um, we were worried, are they gonna you know, feel entitled? Are they gonna um, have an attitude? Uh, you know, how are they gonna respond to the scrutiny and the stress and being in the public eye? And 
and and I give primarily credit to Michelle and my mother-in-law, uh, but I you know like to think I had a little bit something to do with it. Uh, they have just turned out to be these extraordinarily poised, kind, uh, responsible, funny, thoughtful young women. Um, they, they they treat everybody with respect and and courtesy and graciousness, and uh, you know they 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 care about the world and uh yeah don't get me started bragging on my daughters now so all right you, well you know, I, I, that, that that would take up the remainder of our time it is fair to say uh they are the joy of my life thank you again i'm going to turn it over president obama to david snyder thank you so much uh thank you so much debbie uh president obama we have about seven minutes for questions so we'll try to get through a few before you need to uh, and i'll try to be for... short on the answers Exactly, exactly. From our questions committee, what's the greatest international threat to the United States right now? I actually think that uh, what we just described uh, about uh, the, the shrinking uh, number of robust democracies uh, is a concern because we function best when our alliances are strong and there is a broad-based consensus about uh, you know, human rights and, and freedom of the press and uh, science-based uh, responses to things like the pandemic. And, and that requires us to have partners and not be isolated. So a lot of what we talked about with respect to democracy, I think is a, a broader concern. Look. I would still say that our existential crisis is climate change, and I'm very encouraged that the Biden administration is uh, reinvigorating and moving even more aggressively, uh, building off what we did with the climate, uh, Paris Climate uh, Accords uh, to, to address what is going to be an increasing challenge for all of us, because it, it triggers conflict, migration, a, a lot of issues that we are going to be coming up are symptoms of uh, the underlying stresses that climate change is creating. Two questions, one on each side of the spectrum, one uh, a unifying message, one uh, more of a divisive message. Starting with the unifying message, uh, do you see an opportunity to create a party that is fiscally conservative but socially moderate that could bring the country together? And do you believe even a third party has an opportunity to thrive and prosper in our system now? Uh, I, historically, because of the way that our rules are constructed, um, you know, uh, first past the post voting rules, it is very hard for a third party to succeed. Typically, what happens is the third party gets absorbed by one of the other parties. Um, and, and some of that's just the function of how we count votes in this country. Uh, we don't have a parliamentary system. Um, you're seeing some uh, states and municipalities, like New York, for example, uh, starting to run uh, different systems uh, that maybe encourage a broader array of people to uh, and voices and, and, and parties to, to be able to compete. Um, but there, there's no sense that that's going to be adopted on a national level uh, anytime soon. W with respect to fiscally conservative and, and socially uh, moderate, uh, look, I, I know that uh, probably there are a lot of Republicans who weren't crazy about and still aren't about the, um, the drift of their party um, and kind of w wish they could go back to, you know, in, in, in the case of Illinois, a, a Jim Thompson, Jim Edgar uh, world. Uh, and I guess nationally, uh, you know, we probably haven't had a good example of that for a while, but, um, you know, that that's part of the, uh, Illinois tradition. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I, th I think that uh, we're probably not going to be able to return to that tradition. Too much has happened since. I, I, I think what's a, a, a maybe a, a better way of thinking about it is: Can we come up with a uh, a center right party that uh, is? Uh, still speaking to 
the concerns of working families and has answers for what to do about income inequality uh, that incorporates uh, you know, uh, uh, some of the uh, legitimate uh, issues about how the marketplace picks winners and losers, um, and that you know is is tolerant uh, of of differences and and embraces those differences and and you know believes in equality and women's rights and so forth, you know, but maybe has a as a more conservative or market based recipe for getting to some of those questions. Uh, you know, I, I think a, a more traditionally conservative idea, which, you know, has existed in the past, which is uh, different from a radical, uh, you know, let's tip over the apple cart and tear everything down and mistrust everybody uh, approach. Uh, I think there's a market for that, but it's probably going to have to come through a transformation of the Republican Party. And right now we seem very far away from that. Speaking of radical, another question from our questions committee. On a scale of one to 10, how would you rate the, uh, the uh, threat of domestic terrorism today? I, I, I think that, you know, I am always worried about uh, deep uh, divisions that then can kind of morph into conspiracy theorizing and uh, a bunker mentality and militias, given the fact that we've never seen more guns uh, in the hands of uh, our ordinary citizens uh, in our history. I, I, we, got, we got three guns for every uh, single one of the 300 million Americans in this country. And, and and so, uh, even if you get small groups of extremists who want to cause havoc uh, and and hurt a lot of people uh, and trigger more division, uh, they can do it. Uh, and so, I think it's it's important that uh, the FBI and and uh, law enforcement uh, examine those threats seriously and. Uh, there's every indication that uh, uh, law enforcement has begun to do so. Great. President, I know all of us wish we had more time together, but I want to thank you on behalf of our members and guests for visiting with us this afternoon and for just an inspired and enlightening conversation. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. And you're going to have the benefit of uh, Valerie Jarrett, who I'm uh, one of my oldest friends and colleagues, uh, who many of you know. Uh, we're so lucky to have her right now. Uh, helping to steer this uh, Obama Presidential Center uh, forward. Uh, she can give you the details. One thing I want to say to all of you is, is that uh, uh, there are a number of people uh, who are watching who've been great supporters and friends and advocates for the center uh, and have helped us get this far. Uh, I hope that after hearing uh, from Valerie and, and seeing uh, what her plans are, that uh, everybody on this line will, will want to uh, figure out how to be involved. We need the Chicago business community to feel ownership for helping uh, to get this done because that's how great civic projects in Chicago, like Millennium Park, uh, like the Art Institute, uh, you know, that's how we've historically gotten things done and I hope this will be no different.